Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I am Steve Hummerkhaus, the Executive Director at the Forum on Workplace Inclusion here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm pleased to have you here with us today for today's webinar, Achieving Results, Diversity and Inclusion Actions with Impact. Our presenters today are Veronica Huka at uh, DNI Strategies. She's coming to us from Frankfurt, Germany, and Lisa Kapinski from Inc the Inclusion Institute. Uh, Lisa's on vacation in the south of France and coming to us from a hotel conference room. Uh, that's some amazing dedication. Thank you both for being our webinar presenters today. Uh, this is the eighth webinar in the 2018 Forum webinar series, which is sponsored by Aon. We hope you enjoyed the experience and find this information helpful in your work and that you'll join us for future webinars as well. Today, Veronica and Lisa will be presenting for about 45 minutes with Q&A at the end. Uh, please utilize your chat feature in order to ask questions. There will also be several polls throughout the webinar, so please feel free to participate in those too. Uh, at the end of this webinar, you will be asked to fill out a brief survey on your experience. Please take a moment to fill that out so that we get your feedback, which helps us shape future webinars. We truly appreciate your open and very honest feedback. Today's webinar is Society for Human Resource Management and HRCI eligible. The activity IDs will be provided at the end of the webinar. It's also being recorded and will be posted to our website next week and available for download via podcast. Visit our website forum on workplaceinclusion.org or on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for more information. Now, before I hand things over to Veronica and Lisa, I would like to share a brief message from our sponsor, Aon, which is a sponsor of our, of our webinar series. Thank you again to Aon, and, and we'll get busy soon. Where will today take you? Where will you take today? Will you step out into who you are, into who you can be? At Aon, we're committed to helping you be your best and ensuring you experience the best of Aeon. It's your chance to own your potential. A chance to develop professionally through unmatched opportunities and tools to help you succeed. It's your opportunity to work with the best, to learn from and grow with each other. A place where colleagues value one another, where perspectives are embraced and people are celebrated. It's freedom to reach out and make a difference. So clients succeed, so communities grow, so colleagues thrive. This is what it means to work at Aeon. What it feels like when we are at our best. Impact, people, opportunities, and support. This is the Aeon Colleague Experience. And together, it's how we'll empower results. Thanks again to Aon, our, our webinar sponsor. And now I would like to hand it over to Veronica and Lisa to start our webinar. Thanks very much, Steve. This is Lisa. Um, I know we're projecting from Veronica's laptop. Thank you. Okay, it came through successfully. Um, it's always amazing sometimes, isn't it, when we're sitting in multiple levels. And I think you had over 300 participants um, from several countries registered for this call, um, Steve and Ben, you were sharing with us prior. And we're really thrilled that you all are here. And Veronica and I are looking forward to engaging in a dialogue with you over hour here where we share with you the results of this research that we conducted and we'll go into details on that and um, uh, Veronica if we could go to the next slide and there and now you can see who we are <laughs> um, and I'm also based in Germany when I'm not on holiday and I am very pleased to still join you this week even though I am on holiday uh, Veronica and I are um, probably like most of you on this call have been practitioners of inclusion and diversity and driving that change internally in organizations and we've been with several multinational organizations doing this work for oh I, I'm not even sure now decades <laughs> not years it's into several decades um, our space and where we have worked has been across multiple sectors um, it has been at a global level, and, um, and I'm probably, we have partnered with many of you here on the call as internals through networks, forums, connections, or seeing you at a past conference at the Forum on Workplace Inclusion. And we're very pleased for you to invite us in to share about the research. Um, our research approach 
is very much based on our profile and how we work. We've been practitioners. And so for us, we have always been looking for practical advice that works to make a difference, to drive change. Um, so while we are very grounded in the latest research and theories and studies that are out there, we're always with that kind of, you know, raised eyebrow saying, uh-huh, so what is that in our work for driving change? And that was the focus of our study, Veronica, on the next slide, that we would like to share with you here about. So we're very much been focused on doing research now that we have uh, stepped out of being internal change leaders for inclusion and diversity. And now we're external partners uh, working with organizations for inclusion and diversity. We are focused also on doing research. And some of our past research has been focused on women's networks um, and uh, how to ensure that they're aligned to a strategic focus. This current one that uh, was published and we were approached by Newsweek to do and conduct on their behalf, we said, well, it's got to bring those aspects that we feel are important. So it needs to be global. And as you can see, it has a wide scope that we had for the survey and the research that was conducted. And it must be practical focus. It's got to be around the real world of driving that change inside organizations across the multiple sectors and sizes and countries. And it needs to be focused on the actions that will have impact. Um, we're very much trying to break stuck patterns that are in place that we see all too often in the space of inclusion, diversity, and gender parity, equality, and belonging work. A lot of words there, but um, many organizations use different words for this work. Um, so in this space, um, the research is very focused from a global perspective and focus on what will have impact. We'd like to thank very much um, our colleagues and the team at the uh, Forum on Workplace Inclusion for helping to communicate about the survey. And um, it was a great partnership. We appreciate your support in doing that. So, um, Veronica, anything else that we wanted to cover in on this introduction about the research? I think you've mentioned um, everything important. I hope that you can hear me now. Um, yeah. I was muted earlier, so welcome also from my side, and I think you've, you've covered it beautifully. So Great. over to you. Exactly. Let's go into um, some of the questions, some of the, the votings that we'd like to conduct. And Ben, if you could just um, simply open it while I continue talking, that would be extremely helpful. Perfect. Um, what we want to do during this, this webinar is to run by you some of the questions um, that are from the research um, in order to get an insight of where participants stand versus the benchmark that we've achieved. And we'll do that throughout the webcast and discuss the responses as we go. And I see you're already actively participating. Um, question is whether diversity, inclusion, gender parity is a topic clearly visible on the strategy of um, the organization you work. And I mean, what I currently see, trying hard to calculate, 60 something percent actually I'm currently agreeing. Um, shall we give it a few more moments? And then I propose we close the poll while I try to see that. 68% apparently of participants say yes, diversity and inclusion, 69% diversity inclusion, gender parity is a, is a, a subject clearly visible, which is um, quite impressive and quite in line with what we've been seeing um, in the report. So let me continue. One second question. The organization where I work is on track to achieve goals set for this year is the second question and we'd like to hear are you also making progress on the priorities set which obviously is important and you'd as especially as practitioner you'd like to see it not just being considered important but also to see that results are being achieved we seem to have some more hesitancy here responding. People were quicker to answer in the, in the earlier poll. But, and maybe just to restate yeah. also here, all of the polling questions are anonymous, so we're not tracking who's saying what. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. I propose we close it here.
and we see that 54% uh, are on track to achieve their goals. And I'll come back to that. So what we've seen in the, in the survey conducted was that uh, it was very, very close. 70% of respondents to the global survey said, yes, inclusion and diversity, gender parity is a priority of the organization I work. Um, though what we saw, that's um, a 10 percentage points gap to what we are seeing here. Um, sorry, I should have closed my <laughs> communicator. Um, was less than half just 43% were on track to achieve their goals. And I mean, we've had a very, very positive trend here in this room with 54%. Um, Still, um, there's considerable gap between wanting to make progress, seeing it as a priority, and actually achieving outcomes. And what we found, which was even more interesting, or even more shocking, I should say, more disappointing, was that only about one in three said um, of the ones that were not on track said, yes, I could be doing more to support it. Um, I could be doing more in order to drive change. I could be more doing more in order to drive outcomes, um, which shows there's either um, a high level of satisfaction despite limited outcomes, um, or what we found as we um, drove in the research, it was just that people weren't sure what to do. They were quite active. Many organizations were quite active, took a lot of actions, um, but in the end, a lot of those actions apparently didn't pay off. So the research question that we asked was, what is it that organizations do differently that are on track to achieve their goals? And as I already said, uh, organizations were active. Um, we had a long list of offers, of options people could select of what they were doing. We were offering, um, asking about diversity councils, about employee networks, so um, ERGs. We were asking about diversity trainings. We were asking about diversity in hiring and people development in a lot of different fields. And on average, people took many actions. I mean, all of them took something like seven, eight, nine different activities in order to drive outcomes. Um, and still, as, as, as we said before, um, just about 40% were on track with their goals. So what we did was really dig deeper to see, so what is it that makes a difference? What is it that organizations do differently that are on track? Apparently, it's not the number of activities. Apparently, you have to select the right ones, the, wine, the ones that have impact and the ones that drive outcomes. And what we found in essence was that there are three key enablers for progress. One was inclusion and diversity, gender parity, must be embraced as a business opportunity. And we'll speak to all these three points in more details as we, as we move on. The second key enable and key differentiator was that diversity and inclusion must be driven as any other change project. And as you'll see, a lot of organizations didn't. And finally, it was important to create systemic change to look at um, embedding inclusion and diversity in how you do business versus taking independent actions. Lisa, anything I missed? Anything else you'd like to raise at, at this point? No, I think the, you covered the, the quick summary there, which is fairly nice. Um, perhaps one thing we do need to go back again to that very first slide, as all of you saw that about 70% of the respondents were leaders. And so um, we're making an assumption that probably many of you here are somehow attached to driving diversity inclusion initiatives. So you may be the head of the function or working within the function or a diversity inclusion advocate champion or ne and or network leader. Um, we just also wanna call out that within our survey database, the benchmark also had business leaders. So yeah, this will be interesting to see the results from our polling questions. I think we have one coming up next. Absolutely. And relative to the benchmark. So, um, Ben, if you could help us pull up that polling question. 
So uh, we'd like to hear from you all. As you know, uh, we said this is a dialogue for a conversation, and one of the ways are these polling questions. So we really appreciate you taking that to heart. We will be recording the responses as well and doing a follow-up piece of writing on this um, for you to be able to have and share that back within your organization. And one of the key pieces for us in doing this research is that we always wanted to have solid data like this that we could take back into our internal organization and say, aha, look at this. <laughs> so let's see, we're getting some responses now starting to settle in. Let's go for a few more seconds here. So where I work, we formulated a comprehensive business case and understand how diversity and an inclusive culture support the outcomes, the organizational outcomes. Okay, why don't we lock in the results now that we have for this question? Okay, thank you very much for sharing those. Um, if we can go on now to the next slide. So, the business case. Um, I, I, I can imagine if we were all physically sitting in a room or if we had a hands up feature, how many of us have spent or dedicated part of our time to developing that business case? Um, we'd see probably a pretty strong hands up crowd there. Um, it certainly is one of the main focuses. I know when people step into the work that they're being requested either by um, their organization or, or that they say, hey, I gotta make this real. Um, so effort and we, we believe that having a business case is very important but look at the results from the benchmark survey here um, when it comes to actually having it versus using it we see a gap coming up so just uh, two out of five are actually using or leveraging their business case or leveraging diversity what they know from the business case uh, this can help us with our external outreach we see very little happening there and tied to innovation how often do we hear that diversity and inclusion help spark innovation and bring in new ideas and all voices heard um, and that'll contribute to growth and, and new market development and we see an even bigger gap there of um, not even one fourth are considering diversity whenever they're approaching innovation within their organization's product or service development. So their question there is that gap. So why, why do we have that gap? I mean, why is it that we would put so much energy and effort into developing the business case and feeling that that, that is a strong platform What's happening in terms of the ability to leverage the insights gained from that business case? Um, what could be getting in the way? Uh, what could we shift, et cetera? So we very much will want to have places, now we're gonna talk about sharing your experience, and this is one of the areas that we'll be interested in hearing from you. Um, Veronica, do you have anything else you wanted to add on this slide? Well, I think it is really surprising to, to see that gap between, I mean, the energy spent. I mean, I've done the, self, uh, the same thing in my internal role. I've done it uh, as a consultant with many global businesses. And I mean, really trying to make it sense. I mean, making sure that what you wanna do in your diversity inclusion works resonates with business leaders and really working hard to speak their language. And in the end, for some reason, um, still not seeing seeing that being being accepted and I think uh, Lisa you and I we had some discussion about what what could be reasons for that and could it be a discussion about um, a lot of organizations say it's about doing the right thing it's not about um, business outcomes it's not about it's not about the gain it's about it's about ethics and that's why I think it's so important to show that actually it is about both and um, we've got one more slide to, to prove that. I mean, do you want to talk to it? Yeah, yeah. And, and so one thing I just want to check in, thanks very much to one of the participants that said it's hard to hear because of the soft ah. voice. Um, so I am trying to hold the microphone as close as possible. So if you could let us know if you still are not able to hear, um, then uh, we'll, we'll make some more adjustments. But I, I can't eat my microphone. I have it as close <laughs> as I can get it. Um, so uh, hopefully that'll still work. And, and then there was a question also in chat before we go here about questions. Where do we answer the question? So you have a pop-up window that should be showing up um, whenever we go to polling questions. And um, then it's closed, we close it down about 45 seconds to a minute. So it disappears from your screen till we get to the next one. Um, all right, so on this piece of 
insights that came from the global research that we did. This is still in this area of out the business case and leveraging that business case. Well, what we found is the positive side, if you do use your business case um, and all the insights you've gleaned from the work that you put there, the payoff is there. So um, this is the type of data that, you know, Veronica and I wish that we also had at our fingertips when we were internal saying, hey, look, organizations that are leveraging diversity um, as part of their innovation are more likely to be on track to achieve their diversity inclusion goals, 2.3 times more likely to be on track. And organizations that consider diversity as part of their external outreach, also 2.1 times more likely to be on track with achieving their diversity inclusion goals. So that, that connection of the intention and the focus and the framing that's in the business case to the leveraging actually also pays off with impact and results to be more on track to achieve your DNI goals. Continue. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. So this is a space where we want to hear from you. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, again, I just thanks very much to the to about the sound quality. I think Veronica, it might be that my sound quality is not coming through clear. Um, I don't have a finger over the microphone. Uh, it's probably the connection. So Veronica, why don't you take this slide? I hear you very well. So I don't know. It might be me who is the, who is the issue and I can't see the chat. Um, okay. <laughs> still, I'm happy to take the slide. And so what, what we'd like you to share about uh, via the chat is what do you see work to ensure diversity is part of business processes? Many of you said um, that You've got a strong business case and we do hope this also means that it's being translated and actually leveraging diversity in the room. So please do share via the chat what kind of actions do you take? What kind of actions do you see work? And uh, Ben and Steve are going to share with us and share with the group, with all of us in the room what they what they can see, what they, yeah. what they and I, hear. And I, I can read also, one thing I see here, Veronica, someone, as I'm starting to look, read what's here is also, can we explain what we meant by outreach in the survey? And I'll quickly scan what's in the chat. Okay. Um, so there was a two separate, a separate question. One was in essence focused at innovation, at delivering better products. Do we use it in innovation processes and in product design, product development, and anything related to that? And the second question was directly externally focused. So outreach on the one hand could be, uh, I consider diversity when putting together teams to talk to customers, to clients. I consider diversity um, in regards to my sales force. I, I consider diversity when reaching out to, to external stakeholders, to people that matter to my business and have an impact, external um, stakeholders that have an impact on the success of my, my business. And hope that, that answers that, that question. Great, and what we're seeing in the, the chat area to this question um, is about high executive compensation to um, the diversity goals, and that was seconded by someone else. Um, so that's uh, one space, and we will get to leadership accountability results in just a second. And then also um, leadership buy-in, and um, then an additional one is leveraging diversity successes to attract talent. So we'll get to the, also some results around talent attraction hiring. Um, staff engagement, uh, illustrate the ROI or return on investment. Employee training to increase awareness. Um, we have specific roles around accessibility at our institution and we have people of color goals by 2020 across internal staff and board members. And that's tracked annually, um, so that's another about tracking the goals and accountability. Um, oh, be that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, this is wonderful. Great interaction, thank you. Yeah. Diversity and inclusion must be connected to the top leaders in the organization so that it's supported and moves down the organization. So that's a top down um, piece approach. Um, and get commitment on DNI at the highest level so that echoes again, getting the, at the CEO level. 
And um, the way organizations have embraced embedded sustainability is a model on how to embed DNI. Yeah, that's always useful to look over at what may have been a successful change initiative across an organization and see how can that approach be leveraged for inclusion and diversity. And then someone else has come in again. We also have senior leadership involved um, across other cultural institutions and throughout our community to track DNI goals. So fabulous, we have some results from the survey that we're definitely on um, the tracking aspect and the accountability. So Veronica, that's about what we have in the chat so far. Perfect. Well, I think that quite a few of the comments already feed into also into, uh, the the later part of the of the webcast. Mm -hmm. A couple of things that that Lisa and I see working as we um, are active with with global clients is that, for example, also the business case can't be generic. What we find is that it's really important to translate it directly uh, to the specific business or to individual units actually and uh, say what it means to the, the 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 organization itself just saying uh, high level better for talent attraction um, innovation is supported by diversity is something that we find is insufficient for to to achieve buy-in um, also different units tend to hurt in a different way if there is a lack of diversity inclusion. I mean, I've seen, I've worked with a client and they had set goals, I'm working in Europe, uh, on, on nationalities. And in the end, they were never clear on who needs different nationalities, for example, in their management teams. They had a global, a global target um, for Far East Asian nationals. And in the end, a half of the organization was just shaking their heads. They were doing local business locally and just didn't see what that goal meant to them. And even the people who had a need to drive a better a mix of nationality, who had a global scope and needed to find different people, um, kind of didn't feel responsible because they then considered what it meant for them. So what I see really work is making it, making it specific. But um, you might want to address it again in the Q's and A's and go to another question from the report. In the organization I work, and some of that was already covered, there's a direct link between set goals and the planned actions. So if your organization has set goals to increase um, diversity, um, to create a more inclusive culture. How clear are you with the actions? Is there a direct link that uh, people get? Okay, it's not it's coming in. It's still slow. Let's give it a couple of more seconds. Do you have a link between the set goals and the plant actions? Okay, propose we mm -hmm. close the voting. 48% say, yes, there is a direct link. We know what we're doing and why we're doing it. And we've got a follow-up question, I hope, <laughs> which is action will be taken when goals are not met. And we'd also like to ask you to respond to that one. Are you going to take action in case you are behind on set goals? And that action may be you or it may be others in your organization. Shall we mm -hmm. give it a few more seconds? Okay, let's lock it. 
And so what we what we see here is that just one third of participants here in the room say if we are behind goals, action will be will be taken, which is pretty much in line um, with the uh, the global benchmark that we had, that we had conducted. Um, and so, exactly, 33% say action will be taken when goals are not met. Um, and what we, what we found with the, with the research is that saying it's a business priority, saying it's important for us as an organization to be more inclusive, to be more diverse is insufficient. Um, only about half of the respondents who said, yes, the topic's important for us, were actually on, tr on track to achieve their diversity inclusion goals. But I think this is really important. People tend to be on track if they were clear on the one hand with what do we do? What are the actions we take? Um, and that was 70% that directly go into, so what is it we want to achieve and what is it that we need to do in order to get there are on track with their goals versus just 4% that say, um, we have it as priority and we take action, but it's not really visible how those actions support what we want to achieve. I mean, really the actions that, that you want to take. Um, also, just 8% of the organizations who hadn't defined clear accountabilities were on track to achieve their goals, but almost 70% of those that do. And 84% of organizations who say that, yes, we take action when we are off track, were on track versus 13% that didn't. And I believe what is important to call out is we take action. Um, doesn't necessarily mean we fire someone. We take action could be um, we consider what's going on. We take a closer look. We redesign our plans. We rethink. We talk to different people. And what it is that we can do is also something that we'd like to hear from you um, with our next questions. Any tips and experiences you can share to increase accountability and follow through. And I mean, uh, that's really some of the responses from the first questions. And please type in the chat already resonate here, like for example, link it to executive um, compensation. I think there was some very good practices already shared that also pay into increasing accountability. And, I hope and maybe here, as people are typing, we can also, Veronica, address Gwendolyn. You've asked a great question. Um, how do you approach targets so that you know, this is a, you know, right center in accountability is having targets um, so they're not seen as, and you have it in quotes, quotas, or can you? Um, I would, I'm originally from the U.S., and when I moved about 18 years ago to work in Europe, where I've been based for the last 20 years, um, that was a, a really strong question that we had to answer because the quotas aspect was like, you know, oh, that's an American thing. It would quickly get dismissed in a global conversation, that word um, tied to an American frame of reference. So how I oftentimes would approach this is say, well, if we say, so we're going back to that intention, that business case, if we say that this initiative of having greater diverse talent and having a workplace culture that is inclusive is important to us as an organization, and it's important enough that we have a strategy built around it, and let's carry it the next step further, and we have access that are aligned to that strategy and you as leaders are, are in this, what's the next piece? You know, it's any other business initiative, we would have targets there. Now, oftentimes I would reframe that and say these are indicators of success or not success. So with any business initiative, we would have indicators, metrics, measurements to be able to say how on track are we or not. And so that's how oftentimes I would approach that conversation from a global level. And yes, that resistance sometimes can be there around words like 
and many other words that we have in our field. We're not sure the mental model that people may have in their mind, um, but how you can frame them up as a part of an accountability structure, an indicator of success. Are we on track? Are we being effective in our actions? All of those can be very helpful ways to approach this. And the data here from this survey does show us having an accountability structure is one of the areas that we want to see because that does help to carry forward that we're on track. So Veronica, we've got quite a bit here of um, initiatives and, and Gwendolyn, thanks very much for your comment there that that was a helpful explanation. Um, by the way, if there are any other questions that we don't address, there is a Q&A time that we have reserved at the end here. And also Veronica and I will have our contact details. And if you have to want to follow up, we're available to talk with you. Lisa? Um, yes, so I'm gonna, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna take a look. Um, so we have a, just a, a few here. Um, one is, if you don't measure it, it's really hard to advance. That's a great quote. <laughs> um, and strong measures that prove that diversity brings profit. Yeah, that, that's an important one too, to capture that senior leadership engagement and that helps to tie into your business case. Um, having departments set DNI goals in their business plans that tie up to the organizational DNI goals is very helpful. So um, everyone needs to support the goals. Great, getting everyone on board. Um, another one is incorporate the need to keep the roles open until a diverse pool of candidates has been considered as part of the recruiting process. For certain roles, it's more difficult but reiterating this with hiring managers is important. And yes, we're gonna have some data um, coming up just in a, a moment around hiring that can tie into that. And that's what we have in the chat room, Veronica. Perfect. In that case, why don't you just continue with our next poll question? Great. And to Andreas, you're asking about unconscious bias. Hold tight, two more slides, it's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Right now, let's get your polling question up. Um, so in my organization where I work, diversity cri criteria is part of hiring. So for example, um, that you, you have diverse candidates on the short list, um, whatever measures you're taking, is diversity a criteria as part of hiring? This is really insightful for all of us to benchmark what's happening <laughs> um, in the space as we're doing the work. So thank you very much for sharing the, the honesty of what's happening in your organization in the space of anonymity that we have here as well. Okay, so it looks like we're settled in on this so we can close out this poll. And we have a second polling question that we want to also tap into. So we just did hiring and the next one will touch upon the talent management. And we had some questions in the chat section there. Leadership development, career advancement. So in my organization where I'm working, diversity criteria is part of the leadership development career advancement process. And um, that, that's now how you define that. It may be succession plans, it may be your talent programs. Okay. This is interesting, isn't it, around the response rate, if you all are looking at this, at the hiring one, we were more skewed on the upper end, on the agree side, and on the leadership career advancement piece, we get more skewed on the bottom end to the middle. Um, and that certainly has been what our experience has shown as internals, also working with organizations, and what the research is showing. Um, so we can close out this polling question. Okay, and let's go on. And for those, uh, there's one or two of you that were just saying you're having a hard time finding those polling questions. Very sorry that you're not able to find it. We'll try and find a way to um, uh, share the results back and at least that's data for you to supplement the report as well. So back to the research, the global research that we conducted. So driving this work on a systemic or a system-wide um, way is what can help to achieve results. And indeed, that showed in the research that was shared with us um, across all the organizations in the countries, 
that when it was more likely to be considered in your hiring process, so that first question that you all answered, you were 2.2 times more likely to be on track with your DNI goals. But look even more on that leadership development and talent process. And that's the one that we had more response patterns towards the latter half of saying it really wasn't necessarily happening. Um, so we've got once you come in the door, the hiring piece, and then you're in the door, <laughs> you're in the organization and what's happening with your career. If you are leveraging diversity within your leadership development and talent processes, more likely to be on track with your DNI goals. And um, let's see, we've got a comment here that diversity is good for the organization only if it's properly managed. Um, yeah, and this is a good way to say, are we managing it properly? Are these the actions that we talk about when they're aligned to our strategy? Okay, Veronica. So one of the interesting pieces that we asked in the survey was around um, checking out about bias because we know so much is being spent and invested around unconscious bias training. Uh, research shows that that's an $8 billion industry in the US alone each year being spent on unconscious bias awareness training. And yet at the same time, we're finding that the results are kind of spotty. It's not always the case. So here we were very curious around the impact that we were seeing because many organizations were offering unconscious bias training that they were responding. So we asked the question of the participants, have you caught yourself having a biased action and did you do something to correct it? And 53% said yes. But here is the interesting piece and even take the latter part. We also asked, have you caught others <laughs> um, in the moment uh, in the interrupted or challenged having a bias um, action? We're more likely, the respondents were more likely to spot biases in others than themselves and even more so when senior leaders they were more likely to be looking and seeing the biases in others than themselves. So think back to your comments that you had in the chat section around how important it is to get the CEO, the senior leaders engaged and understanding this. But if they've got, and it really is such a thing called the blind, the blind spot bias, <laughs> that we're more likely to see biases in others than ourselves if we're focused on organizational and change and individual behavioral change, this is a troubling space. We need to be able to catch ourselves as well in biases. What is shown to have results, we have on the next slide, which is debiasing. So debiasing is actually working to lessen the impact of bias in our processes that we have. And indeed, organizations that are focused on looking at their processes, such as their career development, their leadership, their hiring, uh, et cetera, meeting facilitation, um, using tools to de-bias, to lessen the impact of bias, are 3.1 times more likely to be on track goals. But yet, we find many are not yet doing that. Um, so just three out of 10 are currently doing debiasing processes. And certainly this is a space where we see a lot of energy and focus starting to come out with organizations working on tools, um, technology-based tools, uh, and how to work and leverage debiasing. And one of the um, areas where I am focused is running a nonprofit on inclusion nudges, which is an open source platform for sharing techniques and approaches that we can nudge or help to steer our behaviors and our processes to have less bias in them. Um, so definitely this is a space and a growth area that can have impact in our organizations to be more on track to help mitigate the impact of bias. Continue. Mm -hmm. You want to take this one, Veronica? Sure. Um, so we'd like to hear from you again. I mean, you shared a lot and many, many helpful examples. And so we'd like to understand what do you do? How do you do it um, to embed inclusion, diversity in HR processes in your organization? What is it that you do? What is it that you see work? Um, how do you make sure that different people have 
the same opportunities to advance and that different needs are being taken into account. And please use the chat again mm -hmm. and we'll have these. So, so some people yeah. were asking about the debiasing tools and I've typed the website for inclusionnudges.org for you there. Um, so that's one source where you can go, but we actually would like to hear also your ideas. What are you currently doing um, that is working in your organization? So here, um, Patricia, thanks very much for sharing. Embedding requires capturing hearts first. Most behaviors evolve with someone um, who's emotionally invested in the evolution. Very good point. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that that is something that, that we keep coming across. And despite the need for facts and figures and hard data and um, the need that Lisa and I also wanted to address with, with this report, um, People are different. They are going to react um, to different approaches. Um, stakeholder management is an important topic and understanding how to approach different people in the best and most effective way is, is key. And very often it is about touching their, their heart. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, we have uh, another comment here about we run reports from our applicant tracking system to review EEO information. Um, so for anyone who's from outside of the U.S., that's a U.S. equal opportunity information. So that's a, a demographic uh, data report for your applicant pool um, that's tied to the U.S. Uh, reporting requirements and legislation. Um, and it's from that uh, EEO data reporting is what hiring sources are most effective, um, mm -hmm. networking with other institutions, and reaching out to community. Um, we have here from Al. Al, thanks for sharing. We measure people for inclusivity scores. So in addition to skills, we understand how their behavior will match teams or departments so they will succeed. Interesting. Um, let's see, we have someone here who does a gender bias training that helps to be aware, but change bias is really challenging. It, it, it really is. <laughs> um, I was just doing some big work with a, a global NGO organization last week, and we were working on some heavy topics in gender parity, and one of them being sexual harassment. And we were trying to focus in on how do you embed, how do you make them? And we need to get this to a behavior level rather than the headlines. Um, so with all of this work that we're doing, what are the specific behaviors that we're trying to change? What are the ways that we interact with our HR processes that we're trying to change? Uh, someone else here says that we also measure teams and organization baselines so we can align to the right people, to the right teams. Um, what I'd like to suggest, because um, I guess we are and that's it. We might yeah. be running out of, out of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are obviously more, very often more complex responses. So if you've got a good practice to share, if you say we do something that is really impactful in our organization, and I'm happy to talk about it, please do re reach out to Lisa. And I would be very, very interested um, to hear what you're doing and uh, use that for for future work and share um, and, and, and hear more about what's going on in organizations. So please do reach out. We'll be sharing our contact data at the end of the presentation, but also want to leave some time for, for questions and answers. So to wrap, this, to wrap up and I mean, give just a quick overview of the final outcomes I would like to return to the beginning of, of the webcast and really see that what we found um, with research was that organizations meeting their D&I goals do three things differently from other organizations. Uh, number one is they've got a coherent approach. So they use a change model, for example, and they go through it step by step and really ensure that it's, they're using a comprehensive system. They are redesigning their processes. This is number two. They are um, debiasing. They're considering where is it that people get stuck 
Um, and how can we change processes? How can we change the way we work? How we, can we change our organizational DNA in order to create equal opportunities? And finally, they don't just do inclusion diversity work um, to do the right thing, but they also make sure that it benefits their business. They also make sure that they actively leverage the people they've got and see the benefits financial benefits, business benefits of the work that they are doing. So they drive business outcome and build momentum. And that was a short summary of our findings. And we'd like to use the last 10-ish minutes for questions and answers, additional comments that, that like, you'd like to share. Um, one thing, and there was a question that was coming up, are there, what are some tools for debiasing? Um, so I just typed one into the chat section around uh, uh, the gender decoder. And I'm sorry, I don't remember the website off the top of my head, but just type in the gender decoder. This is a free tool that helps you to detect um, gender bias language, for example, in your job descriptions. And um, it's one that many organizations are using or use it as a framework to develop their own in-house um, because your own language inside your organization may be very specific to you. So um, there are a few others that are out there that are free and open sourced. Um, and then there are, this is one of the fastest growing spaces I'm seeing in consultancy coming out as well. Um, and many of them can be expensive, but um, I, I do have several that I can share with you. So I would say that um, uh, we post them up on the Inclusion Nudges website, some of them, or reach out and we can share those with you as well. Veronica and I have experience with several of them. And we'd love to hear from you, your own experience with debiasing tools. I don't see um, any other um, questions right now. Let's see. There was a book recommendation in the chat. So thank you for sharing that book recommendation. Um, so, Steve, perhaps you'll want to pull that out in the follow-up piece. Yes, that was Robin D'Angelo's uh, White Fragility, if I remember correctly, from reading the yeah. chat earlier. Oh, and Steve, thanks. You, I see you put um, Kat's uh, Gender Decoder website there. Yep, I just did a quick look for it. Yeah. Um, there's another great one for silent brainstorming that a professor from Wharton School of Business, um, Lauren, uh, I'll have to find it and come back to you. It's a also free open source tool for helping for debiasing um, how decisions are made and to make sure all voices get heard. A third one, a debiasing free tool is um, from Matt Wallert um, called GetRaise.com that helps to equip both men and women to go in for those discussions around asking for a raise and trying to help close the gym. There was a question from Love Yara about uh, what you suggest for unconscious bias. Uh, free is in, is in parents, because um, that's always an issue. Of course, the IDI is not an inexpensive tool. Uh, do you have one that is free, uh, perhaps the Harvard implicit bias test at least, but are there others that you can think of that you know? Yeah, you know, a lot of organizations have put their, um, there's so many bias training workshops out there that are free also now. I think if I recall Google about two years ago put it as an open source. And um, I think Microsoft put theirs out. Um, there are various ones that are out there. I mean, for me, uh, both as having been an internal and an external working in this space. Look, we could say what is bias in two or three sentences, couldn't we, Veronica? Um, the real challenge is getting on with the work of debiasing, and that's where we need the energy focus. I mean, it's a little bit like that business case. We don't want to get stuck in creating the business case, and we also don't want to get stuck in running around doing a lot of training on unconscious bias. That, you know, let's just... Yeah, and it was, I mean, we really looked into the data to see um, is unconscious bias training, is it a tool, is it an activity that, that drives outcomes? 
because there's, I mean, as, as Lisa mentioned earlier, there's such a massive investment. There's such a big interest and I kind of everybody is doing it. So we thought, well, let's see whether this is one of the um, big impact tools and it, it simply wasn't. So in the end, what we've, what we've really, really found was that those standalone activities, they can be interesting, they can be engaging, they can be, they can be nice, but unless you do it systemically, unless you change behaviors in the organization, unless you change who's being selected, who is being hired, and how people are being selected, it's not gonna, gonna have an impact. And I'm, I mean, I really remember distinctly when I, um, I mean, the early days when unconscious bias training come up in the, well, 2000, don't know when, eight, nine. And I mean, I, talk, I talked to many of the early adopters and very, very quickly, quickly I mean, the, what, what I heard people come back with was that everybody's engaged, it's interesting, everybody likes it, um, and they walk away and do the same old things, uh, which is also, I mean, just like, like Lisa showed um, with, the, with the research, is yes, they understand um, the term bias. Yes, they, they can spot biases in others, but in the end we decided against sharing the data for senior leaders in, um, yes, I've caught myself in being biased because the number was ridiculously low. It was something like 20% of leaders, senior leaders said, yes, I've caught myself being biased. And 70% of them caught somebody else being biased. And all of them had attended um, unconscious bias trainings you could expect. And I mean, I understand that many organizations, they just, there, there seems to be a need to do unconscious bias training because everybody does it. And if you haven't done it yet, it, it, it feels like missing out on, on a big thing. Um, although I must really admit, if I had a limited number, a, a number of people, a limited time, limited budget to invest, and probably limited share of mind with senior leaders and key stakeholders, there's other things to do which have a bigger impact. There are several questions also as well. There's a lot of a great uh, chat things that people are suggesting uh, from literally around the world. Uh, chat is a part of the recording, so you should be able to see that next week when we post it. Uh, but we do have a question here, uh, and I think there's just two left. Uh, do you have any best practice examples of companies that are doing DNI well? I would specifically love to hear examples of companies that tie DNI to business outcomes. So. That's a great question, and I think my answer will frustrate you. <laughs> um, and this comes back to what works for one organization may not work for another. And that's why I really strongly avoid the term even best practice. I say good practice. And this gets back to how do we embed the work in our own organization? What does it mean for our organization's business case? Um, what is going to, some of you were typing in the chat, getting your CEOs and engaged. So what will connect with them? There's so many internal variables that you are working with as a change maker in this space that um, it's around, okay, scanning what's happening. That's why we were doing the research to help give you some data around what's happening externally and then translating that, what does that mean internally for your organization? I think it gets problematic if we hold up particular companies and say, oh wow, they're really outstanding. And I, I can't say there's one outstanding company. Many companies have good practices in particular areas that we can look at. And um, I think it's look at it, reflect, and then say, what does it mean for me in my situation? And by the way, um, I did find that uh, decision-making tool that's free. It's called usecandor.com, and I just put that in the chat section. There was, oh, another question. Um, I think it's from Marty Rains. I think that's M Rains, Marty Rains. I'd love to see samples of business cases that are targeted directly to specific business lines or divisions. So that's maybe a comment as much as a question. Um, that's an interesting idea if we made something open source around that. 
Imagine if we had a database all ready to go with certain sectors and relevant data and facts. I mean, this is something all of us here could do, <laughs> um, could create and contribute uh, without violating any company confidentiality, but uh, what is there? And then how can you quickly turn to that and don't spend so much energy on recreating something that's already out there, but put your energy on now, okay, let's get the work going to de-bias, to change our organization, to get our stakeholders on board, to get our executives on board. Um, I don't know of a one-stop shop right now for that. It's, it's many disparate pieces of information that are out there. Veronica, are you aware of any kind of one stop to turn to if, as you're doing your... Well, I think it really depends on um, what um, that, that unit, that organization is, is, is looking for and finding... Um, finding an issue that um, that that is perceived by them as an issue and that uh, that that can be addressed um, so I mean I, I've seen very very concrete concrete um, business cases broken down by um, by units and I mean my experience is it's what people buy into and I mean I, I've, I've once worked with a client I mean that was incredibly uh, frustrating i must admit because i mean they had they also went with a generic by um, business case and um it was always um diversity drives innovation and then they talked to that it was an innovation organization and they talked to the head of innovation and i mean he obviously told them he was very uh, innovative and this was not an issue um, that he had and absolutely declined talking to them um, ever again and so i do believe that uh, it must be recognized as an issue. And the issue that the perceived issue probably can only be developed um, together with the stakeholders within that very organization. I think generally, um, if you try, tell them from the outside, you've got a problem, you need to fix it, and I know how. Um, you might not <laughs> make yourself your friends. There is a lot in the chat, of course. Um... And we are also out of time. So I, I think we'll have to leave it there. Uh, we've got, of course, like I said, the re recording will be coming in next week. The chat is a part of that. So we'll be able to see all the things that people suggested. Thank you so much for the suggestions. Uh, uh, here at the forum, we believe in co-creativity, uh, that we all have expertise and we all have things to share and that ultimately we're all better when we work together. So this chat has been extremely, um, an extremely good example of, of that in action as it's going forward. So thank you all for that. And of course, many thanks to Veronica and Lisa uh, for being on the call today, especially uh, coming from overseas and different time zones and different locations. Um, uh, I really appreciate all the extra effort on that part. Um, and of course, a special thank you to our sponsor, Aon, uh, for the webinar series this year. Um, the activity code for SHRM, for the Society for Human Resource Management, uh, which we will post uh, in the chat, uh, is 18 7H5. VW. Hopefully, Ben, you're typing that in for me while I'm reading it. I see it's there. Uh, and the HRCI activity code is 367026. Uh, and so they have been posted to the chat for anyone needing those. Uh, for our next webinar, I hope you'll join us at a slightly different time. Uh, in fact, our next two webinars at a slightly different time because both of the presenter, all the presenters are coming from Asia. Uh, I think all or most of them are coming from Hong Kong. One might be coming from India. But the next one coming up in November is with presenters Joji Shekhan Gill uh, and Rita Chung, both of which DuPont in Asia. Uh, they'll be talking about communications across cultures. I, I met Rita when I was in uh, Hong Kong last November and had an amazing conversation of how she has to translate US vernacular into standard English and then translate it into the multiple cultures that they're dealing with in, in Asia fascinating work. Um, the, for more information about those webinars, that'll be up on our website. Uh, you can check there um, at forumworkplaceinclusion.org or on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter, and just search for the Forum on Workplace Inclusion. I want to thank everyone for their participation today. We hope you have a great rest of your day, uh, and we'll talk to you next in November. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.